Okay, so we're just going to do a little uh, lesson on composting. Um, so this is relevant to the RHS level 2 theory um, within the soils module. So first of all, let's look at the different types of composting that are covered. So if you want to zoom in on here. So in the syllabus, we've got these main types of composting that we have to cover. Garden compost, leaf mould, wormeries, hotbeds, and compost teas, um, comfrey and nettle tea. So we've got to look at all those different types of composting. What separates these different methods uh, is what organisms are the main key workers in each of these different types of composting. So our workers, this is what we mean by our workers, so you know what organisms actually break down garden material and turn it into compost. So these are our workers. We've got bacteria, fungi, worms, and what we call microfauna, which are your wood lice, your insects that are, and slugs, lots of slugs um, break down organic matter, but they're actually good slugs because they're, you know, they're composting for us. So those are our key workers. So in garden compost, we've got all of these working away. Um, but if we want to hot compost, it's our bacteria that are our main workers. With leaf mould, again, we've got all of these going on, but it's mainly fungi, which are our main workers. Um, in a wormery, yes, it's worms that are the main workers, but there'll be fungi and bacteria in there too. Um, and in a hotbed, again, it's bacteria that are the key workers. And in our teas, our liquid teas, again, it is definitely mainly bacteria that are breaking down the organic matter. So the different type of composting is linked to which is the main worker. And then so what we do for each of these different types is to provide the ideal environment for that worker. So for garden composting, we've got all of these present, uh, but we are trying to encourage more bacteria workers, sort of the ideal place for them, so that we can go more towards hot composting. And hot beds is just um, a kind of a niche, I guess, within hot composting, and we'll cover that separately. Um, so let's focus on garden composting. So first of all, what equipment do we need? Um, so we need some kind of container. As gardeners, we're just trying to speed up the process. So here's some different containers and we'll come back to these right at the end to evaluate the different designs. So uh, this is our bay system and it's good to have three bays because you can fill one, you can leave one, and you can use one. So fill one, leave one, use one. And you can also obviously move the compost from one bay to another really easily. Often they have these um, front surfaces that you can dismantle to make it easier. So that's the bay system. And then there's these smaller Dalek type um, composters for a small garden with a little hatch that you can lift to remove the compost that's been made at the bottom the Dalek style, I call those. And then you can get uh, tumbling composters where you can, there's a little handle on one side, you can um, mix the contents easily. And then these are becoming quite popular, these hot composters, which they're about the same size as the Dalek ones, but they're really got a very thick insulated wall. Um, you do add some activators to get them going and some of them will have a pipe in the middle that gives in gives lots of oxygen to the centre. So first of all we need our um, structure that houses the compost. We'll need a garden fork or spade to mix our compost, that's another piece of equipment that we need. Um, we might need a sieve perhaps if we're going to sieve our finished compost. Um, and we might also use something called um, a compost activator and this brand is called Garotta and this contains lots of nitrogen, um, some microorganisms, some bacteria that will speed up the process and 
also some lime because compost does tend to become more acidic as time goes by, particularly if it's been washed through by rainwater. So this will restore a good pH balance um, because when it becomes too acidic, your worms and your other organisms don't like it and they don't work as well. So garotta is a good uh, compost activator. So that's our equipment and then obviously we need our ingredients to put into our composter. So we, these, this is, these are our ingredients and we can split them up into two categories, browns and greens. Our browns are very high in carbon and our greens are very high in nitrogen. And the ideal proportions um, of browns and greens is having a ratio of 30, sorry, 15 to 30 parts of carbon to one part of nitrogen. So it's 30 to one, or sorry, between 15 to one and 30 to one, anything in that range. Um, the RHS, I think they state 15 to one um, or 30 to one, so anything within that range. So what that means is, if we look at something like straw, for example, the carbon-nitrogen ratio, if we were to break that down, is about 200 to 1, roughly. Um, whereas if we look at grass, the carbon-nitrogen ratio is 10 to 1. So if we had a mixture of straw and grass, that would make our carbon-nitrogen ratio more like, I don't know, at a guess, 100 to 1 perhaps you know we're getting more towards the ideal so this is why we need to mix our browns and our greens so that we're aiming for this 30 to 1 ratio um, so knowing which are browns and which are greens are really important we want to by volume equal proportions of these two so that we're getting more of a, a good carbon nitrogen mix so these are things we can put in the compost bin. Newspaper, cardboard, straw, um, dry sawdust, uh, um, bark chippings, woody prunings. A lot of these do look brown in colour. And then for nitrogen, we've got all our herbaceous material, grass clippings, anything that's soft and green. Weeds without the seed head on because we don't want the seeds to come up in our compost um, and tea bags and these have got to be organic a lot of the tea bags you buy are actually have got a plastic outer bag um, obviously the inside is organic but yes be careful if you put a lot of tea bags in and make sure that they are compostable uh, coffee grounds is another thing that you can add as well with the filter bags so um, those are your ingredients that you're going to put in your composter so Let's just mention hot and cold composting. As I said, we will go into hot beds, which is hot composting. But with these containers, depending on which container you use, you can go more towards hot composting, which is your ideal type of composting. Your bays are really good for hot composting. Your ideal size of bin will be one cubic meter. So each of these would be a cubic meter. Hot composting is where you um, add a lot of greens and browns mixed together in one go. So you've got a huge cubic meter, which obviously will sink down, but it's a, it's a big volume. The bacteria inside there will start breaking down the organic matter. If you ever add a lot to your compost, even if it's just grass on its own, it feels really warm for a while, doesn't it? And that's because the bacteria are generating energy and making it feel warmer. Now, as you know, if you've only added a bit, that temperature soon reduces and it goes cold. But if you have a huge volume in one go, it will heat up in the middle and it has like a layer of insulation around the outside, which keeps it warm like a woolly jumper. So the temperature inside will actually raise quite high, up to 60 to 80 degrees C. And that's good because it will kill off any weed seeds. So ideally, you would aim for hot composting. That's what they do on council sites, you know, for your municipal waste, they do hot composting. So it should be weed free. Um, most 
domestic gardens don't have enough material to add that much in one go of browns and greens so you know it's something we could aim for but not usually achievable in a small garden it's more on you know large estates where they'll do that method the benefit of hot composting is it's much faster and you will get compost within um, three months doing it that way and you've got to turn it a lot but we'll come back to that later so for most of us it's cold composting where the bacteria are still working but they're a lot slower and they don't generate that heat that stays it doesn't get as hot um, we're adding little and often okay so that's hot and cold composting um, so as gardeners the key thing we're aiming to do is to speed up composting composting happens anyway so if we have a look at this picture here we've got our browns and our greens going into our container and if they're left there long enough they will turn into compost you know even a tree trunk put into a compost bin it might take I don't know 40 years if it was thick enough it was if it was oak 40 years but eventually it would make compost so we're speeding it up so we need to provide the ideal conditions and that means that we need to have water present air oxygen present um, and we need to have the right combination of ingredients so what are the key ways that we can speed up composting and we'll move over to this first of all we need the ideal mix of browns and greens so that all of the organisms are working as quickly as possible having a best mix also means that there's a lot of air in there if you have a lot of greens it tends to sort of sink and be airless so having the right mix also allows a lot of air to get in there Oxygen is really important because, as you know, any living thing needs oxygen. So this will fuel your fungi bacteria, your worms. Um, so turning your compost regularly will speed up the process. For hot composting, it should be done every two weeks. But a cold compost will also benefit from this. I only do mine once a year because that's the only time I can do it in the winter. But ideally... If you've got time, once a month, it would be very beneficial. Moisture is essential. All living things need water to live. So again, making sure it's moist but not soaking wet. If it's soaking wet, there's no oxygen. If it's completely dry, the organisms can't work. And that's a problem with some of the sealed um, containers is that it doesn't let the rain in and if we forget about it it might become too dry and composting will stop. Size of your compost we've talked about hot and cold so if you can manage hot composting you're going to get your compost faster um, and also the size of your ingredients um, is important uh, so chopping up everything as small as you can will allow all those workers to break it down as quickly as possible. There's that saying, isn't there? How do you eat an elephant? Well, you eat it bit by bit. So what they're doing is they're just breaking it down and making it easier to eat. So chopping up everything is really important. If you do want have to put um, woody prunings in, if you can shred them, that would really speed up the process. And then finally, warmth is really important. So a lid helps to keep the heat in. Um, the size of the compost structure will help to insulate it, to speed it up as well. So, uh, and maybe siting it in a warmer spot in the garden, although you don't always want to look at your compost bin. So you might have to put it in a little cooler corner. Um, I've mentioned volume in with the size of so the volume of your uh, compost area. So all of these points, will speed up the rate of composting, which is what we as gardeners are, gardeners are aiming for. But compost will happen anyway. Um, so finally, problems that you can get in the compost bin. Uh, it can be too dry if you've got the lid on, so you will just add some water to it, or you could add some greens because they tend to be more moist. You'd have to mix it all together, of course. So too dry, add water or more greens. Too wet, 
you could add more browns and turn it again and put a lid on to stop it getting wet in the future. Um, you do not add meat and dairy produce because you can get vermin get going into your compost bin. Um, those are all the problems I can think of. Can you think of any other problems, Anastasia? No. So I think that summarises um, the main points of composting, uh, but obviously a lot of the detail will be in your notes.